All right, I want you to open your Bibles to Ephesians 5, please. Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to learn some really good stuff today. We're going to learn some really good stuff today. How to get power. And what I'm going to do tonight is teach you everything in the Bible on how to receive power. And believe it or not, these things are, total, uh, are really underestimated. And believers are losing power and not taking advantage of it. There's a lot of good stuff, actually, with what we have. And believe it or not, it's tied to the basics of what we do. But we just don't practice them. We just don't practice them. Okay. So let's go to uh, the book of Ephesians, chapter 5. Now, the, the obvious one, when I talk about power, what's going to occur in your mind, obviously, when I talk about power? It's, what's going to obviously occur in your mind? It's going to be uh, the filling power of the Holy Spirit, correct? So when I talk about the filling power of the Holy Spirit, it's pretty obvious that we do know that's how we receive power. But I want to tell you that it's, I believe there's more than that. I believe there's more than that. So we're going to have to examine those areas on how to receive power. And uh, I'm going to see if I can go through everything tonight. Hopefully I can go through everything tonight. And you might go, really? It's that much? Yes, it's that much. Believe it or not, there's a wealth of information on the scriptures how to receive power and you can guess why you have no power in your life. You ever thought about that? So you have to look at yourself and then find out why it is that you're not receiving power lately in your life. What is it that those people in the Great Awakening revivals, what they got that differed from what you got, right? Because they practice better than you and I do. That's the thing. They practice better than what you and I did. So we need to examine these parts, find out why. Okay, so let's cover the filling power of the Holy Spirit. We do know that is the most coveted thing. That is the one that's most uh, emphasized by Great Awakening Revival preachers when they talked about the filling power of the Spirit. Billy Sunday, his preaching was phenomenal. Charles Finney won so many souls, but they... But their topic was on the filling power of the Spirit. So there have been many sermons about that. Me, I have preached about, I think, maybe five, maybe five sermons just on the filling power of the Spirit. But that is one of my favorite basic doctrines, is the filling power of the Spirit, because it's so practical and real. When we cover the filling power of the Spirit, there are three things out of this that you need to practice so that you can get the filling power of the Spirit. So again, like I mentioned to you before, a lot of this might be something that you might know about, but it's something that we don't practice, or you didn't see it that way before, and maybe even new information. Or it was old information, believe it or not, that you actually forgot, that you never thought about. So that's why this teaching tonight will be good. So how do we get the filling power of the Spirit? Verse 18, and be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now notice this, how you get filled with the Holy Ghost is through singing praises, correct? When you sing praises, that's how you receive power from God. If you deny that, or if you don't think so, then all you have to do is go to our revival meetings. Now there's no doubt there's something powerful that moves, right? It even works, get this, I've seen it in summer camps. Youth who have no heart for God or who are pretty much dead, when they get caught up with one to two hour, three hour, four hours of hymn singing, all of a sudden you see them shouting. You see them shouting, tossing up hymn books, running the aisles, and then finally getting on the altar when before they never got on the altar. And hymn singing was done before the preaching. You notice that? That's very powerful. So, singing hymns does have a powerful effect. There's no doubt when people walk in that they can see this church is different, right? In the first part of the service. 
Why? The singing. Singing is key. So then, when you sing, is it a dead machinery? Or are you singing it like you mean it? And the power of God can flow in the room. Don't we, ha I mean, I don't care if we get five people or 50 people. I've seen it all the time, all right? Where you get a hundred or a couple hundred, doesn't matter. The Holy Spirit moves within the singing. We've seen that too many times. I remember in my low days where I only had one church member, we sang hymns for 30 minutes straight. I remember one time my car broke down, I couldn't go to church. So me and, my, me and the brother just sang hymns inside the car, stuck and stranded in the middle of the road for like 30 minutes. Yeah, we had a good time. That's the power of God. But now here's the important thing. It's easy to sing hymns when you're with the brethren, right? Or if it's a special meeting. The verse says to receive the filling power of the Spirit is not in meetings. In verse 19, speaking to yourselves. Now, when that's the reason why you live a life full of defeat then. Because when hard times happen to you, you're not singing to yourself. Look, you're not singing for me. You're not singing for the church. You're singing for yourself here. So sing to yourself, and that actually glorifies God. And trust me, the mood does change. The mood does change. It's very weird. Music is very powerful. It changes the atmosphere, the mood. When you have a bad day, then just sing hymns. Sing songs that glorify God to yourself. So create that atmosphere. It's a very powerful effect. That's why you live a life full of weakness and defeat, because I would dare say you don't sing much praise to God by yourself. That's something to think about, right? That's something to think about. The second thing right here is giving thanks. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Another thing is to give thanks to God. That's how you get filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Again, it just matches with him singing that when you feel defeated or you feel down, then you just have to thank God as well. Amen. But it's very hard to thank God when you're feeling the pain, correct? Mm -hmm. So that's why it's very important to realize what you're thanking God for, how much it means to you. If you keep uh, giving complaint, for example, then you lose power in your life. But when you constantly give thanks, you notice your mood changes and you feel more powerful. Your mood becomes powerful. There's more energy into it. You feel more thankful when you come to this church. So there's got to be a spirit of thanksgiving within you. Even in bad, I mean, this is so great with us Christians. Get this now. Bad things, even in bad times, you can find some, something to thank God for. Isn't that something? Amen. Lost people do not have that. Because if bad things happen, bad things happen. So they always talk about try to find a silver lining, you know. Well, that's pitiful. Because we know that the specific bad thing that we go through, we still got Romans 8, 28. See? So we got a lot to thank God for. Giving thanks is very powerful. Lost people can definitely see that. They can see that in spite of their riches and possessions that they all have in life, whereas you are totally meager and you don't have much compared to them, but yet you're more thankful and more happy than they are. Don't you think that draws them to Christianity? Yeah, right. That makes them curious and go, what is it that you got? That's a power that cannot be explained. And that's from the filling of the Spirit, which is done through giving of thanks. And the other one is submission. Submission. Now, nobody likes that, but that's important. Now, the husbands are saying amen, because I know what you're all thinking. But... Submission is not the wife here. Amen. You notice right here, verse 21, submitting yourselves, what? One to another in the fear of God. Then we come to wives submitting. <laughs> so in other words, that's more important to God, is that everybody submits to each other rather than the wife submitting. That's more important to God. Now, when the woman feel like, yeah, that's right, bro. that's right, preacher, that doesn't minimize your role. 
if verse 21, women, that includes you submitting yourselves one to another, then that's why verse 22 follows. Wives have to submit to husbands. So the reason why the Lord's not blessing you with power in your life is because you're not submitting to your husband. And then husbands don't think that wives have to be the ones to submit to you when you're overlooking your role. Believe it or not, when it says submitting one to another, there are times, now this might sound heretical, but this is true. When that verse is submitting one to another, that includes people with leadership positions who will submit to the people that they are leading. Amen. Because leaders are actually serving their community. Amen. Do you understand that? So yes, husbands do submit to wives. Pastors submit to members. And leaders in charge of a government or a business submit to uh, their employees or to the people they serve. Why? Because they're serving them. See that? They're serving them. That's important to understand. It's not a, a position that is abusive or authoritarian, and that's it. That's not how it is. Every role, whether you're serving or you're leading, is all uh, surrounded by submitting to one another. That's what it does. It's profiting each other. So how well <clears throat> are you submitting to one another? You don't submit to each other if there's bitterness or arguments against each other or a bad spirit in church. That's why the power of the Holy Spirit is just zapped. Easily, you can kill the power of the Holy Spirit because so many Bible believers do not abide by verse 21. They critique. They all critique. You know, well, I can preach better. I can teach pa better. Uh, Pastor so-and-so shouldn't have said it that way. Well, I know what's going on with brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so, so why is he or she acting like a hypocrite serving God, but what, that, what they did to me was, see that? See that? Then you just kill the Holy Spirit moving within a revival meeting. So that's why that uh, submission is very important to receive power. That's how you receive the filling power of the Spirit. Now, get this. The filling power of the Spirit is one of the most coveted things that we want in our lives. How do you get the filling power of the Spirit? Well, one is you have a strong desire, obvious. Two is you pray for it. And then three is to yield, correct? So we all know that from our previous beginner's discipleship class. But we don't see the other three sides within the filling of the Spirit. If you pray for the filling of the Spirit and you yield and you do whatever, are you and acting, are you acting out these three things? See that? If you're not acting out these three things, then you are not receiving the filling power of the Spirit no matter how much you fast and pray for it. No matter how much you think you're yielding to the Spirit, because in that case, you're not. Think about it. If you want a powerful Christian walk, with fruits from the Lord and etc., the Lord doing great things in your life, how well is your obedience? How well is your uh, thanksgiving, good mood, attitude, joy in the Lord? Do you sing to yourself when these sorrowful times happen? And I mean God's music, not the worldly music, right? A lot of people, t music is very powerful that the devil uses it. We don't want to sing that to ourselves and we dr lose the power of God. You want to sing those old-fashioned hymns, the right songs, the right music. Now, if we are filled with the Spirit and these things are enacted in our lives, the filling of the Spirit is very different from the gifts of the Spirit, correct? Uh, go to Romans chapter uh, 12, please. Romans chapter 12. Has that been archived recording the whole time? Then it must be full. All right. If I perish, I perish. Let's just go for it, brother. Yeah. It's okay. We got it live stream. Yeah. All right. Romans chapter 12. We look at verse 6. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, 
or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness, let love be without dissimulation, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Here's another one. I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter 12. First Corinthians chapter 12, excuse me, chapter 12. The gifts of the Spirit are mentioned again, and we've covered some of them, showing mercy and then teaching, encouraging people, all that. These are gifts that God has uh, divided and given to every one of you. So understand this, some of you have gifts that me, that I don't have. So you have a power of certain gifts, talents, and abilities that you can use for the Lord that I cannot do. Now, do you realize how powerful that is? I'm basically telling you, you're going to have more power than me. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Do you realize that? Because you have certain gifts that God gives to you, that God gave to you that he didn't give to me. Verse 1, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Verse 4. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations. Now get this, but it is the what? Same God which worketh all in all. That's God working in you when you act out those gifts, correct? When God is working in you, you know what that is? That's the mighty, powerful work of God. Then the verse says, He that hath begun a good work in you Amen. shall perform it until the day of Christ. See, that verse shows it's the mighty hand of God. The mighty work of God, listen, did not stop with Moses when he split the Red Sea in half. It continues within you today. That's how the Holy Spirit's using you. The Holy Spirit, get this, the Holy Spirit did not choose signs and wonders for the 2,000 years of church age. Do you understand that? The Holy Spirit did not choose the hands that would heal the sick and raise the dead and speak in new languages and tongues and etc. He did not choose to do that. A lot of charismatics get into this stuff and then they just dabble with devils. That's all gone. Those are called sign gifts. These gifts that God has given are gifts that are not part of the signs. So you notice that the gifts of the Spirit, they have sign gifts within 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12, but then they have gifts that are not sign gifts. But that still is the same mighty power of God. Charismatics keep saying, why are you diminishing? Why are you dismissing the power of God? No, why are you right. dismissing the power of God by limiting it to just signs? That's very disgraceful to the Lord. The Lord did many different ways to do His miracles, to, do, to manifest His mighty power. And it's not speaking in tongues, healing the sick. It's what? One miracle is the Word of God that you got in your hand. Amen. Another miracle is you encouraging somebody in the church or in your life that rescued that person from committing something tragic. Right. That was a mighty work of God. Yeah. Mighty work of God is in the ministry as you preach the word and that spiritual power comes out and then affects the members and they can't help but just come down on the aisle and then change their life for God. That's a gift. There are preachers that got a gift to do that. How well are you working on it? How well are you using it? Or do you belittle it? See that? A volunteer sheet is not just for you volunteering. It's because you have a gift that you can do it. The bulletin has volunteers that we need for singing, for even nursery, for even preaching, teaching classes, all that. That's a gift. How well are you using it? 
you know what? You don't think that as the power of God. That's your problem. But, and that's why you're sitting on your tail doing nothing for God. The power of God starts with what are you going to do with the gifts that, he, that he's given to you. Amen. You know how I'm able to have all these fruits with the ministry God has blessed me with? Not because I'm great, not because I'm talented. If you knew me from back then, I am completely under-talented. And like I told you a few times, my parents were extremely worried about me that I wouldn't make a living, I wouldn't be able to take care of myself, and then I'm kind of weird. Hey, by the way, they even told my wife that when she dated me. Gene, she's just weird, so just letting you know. Thanks, you know. Thanks, Mom and Dad, you know. So, so they were worried about me, all right? They were that worried about me. Because I am not really mental, mentally, I guess, normal. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but notice right here that the, the person that everyone is surprised, wow, you got talent, the Lord's using you. No, if you knew me from my beginning, I don't. But that came, the result came of the so-called talent that you see by working hard on it, by using it even through my mistakes, the tons of mistakes that I've done. I just kept doing it and doing it, and now look what the Lord did with me. How about you? What are you going to do now? Amen, you want the power of God? I got a lot of fruits, but that's because I did my job. I did my job. That's the Holy Spirit working in you, right? Gifts differ from the filling, but... The Holy Spirit can fill within your gift that you use for Him. The verse says God is working in it. See that? So as you keep acting out your gifts, let the Holy Spirit fill you and then fill within the gifts that you act out. That can be a powerful thing. Powerful thing. All right. Let's dig into this a bit more. Let's cover, oh, what would be a good place? This is a very good place. Why don't we go to Ephesians 6? We'll go to Ephesians 6. The armor of God. The armor of God. Now, we take it for granted, and we know the passage, that the armor of God is protection from demonic attacks, correct? But believe it or not, each... Part of the armor is a powerful weapon. It is a powerful item that you can use that fills within your life, that fills within power for you, believe it or not. I think each part of the armor consists of power and does something with your life. <clears throat> I'm going to give several examples here. So let's first start it out with Ephesians chapter 6, and we'll start at verse, let's see right here, uh, verse 16, uh, not verse 16, verse 17, verse 17. Let's start backwards, okay? Let's go backwards here. And take the helmet of salvation. All right, the helmet of salvation. That is a powerful part of the armory. Why? It's not only to protect you from demonic attacks. The helmet of salvation is powerful because, think about this, do you underestimate the power of the sealing of the Spirit no matter how, man, how much you messed up in your life? Do you underestimate the power of eternal security? Do you underestimate the power of the cross where Old Testament saints had to offer animal sacrifices <coughs> where lost people think that they have to do so much good works to get them to heaven, but all of man's effort is just weak at best. And so Jesus Christ, by that act of dying on the cross, giving salvation to all of mankind, that reconciled everything, that cleared away all the sin, that justified uh, mankind and reconciled holy man with filthy, sinful man. Wow. All from the powerful act called salvation. When that lost sinner bends on his knees and receives Christ for his salvation and gives out the sinner's prayer. Do you understand what act is taking place? It's a powerful moment where he is transformed from darkness to light. 
because not even Satan has that power to wash away your sin. Satan Amen. does not have the power to get you to heaven because he himself is too weak to get to heaven himself. Do you understand this power that you have? It's greater than the devil's. It's the power of salvation. Helmet of salvation. All right, y'all got that, right? And if you don't, ask one of us. We'd be happy to show you how to get saved. If you're not 100% sure how to be saved or if you would go to heaven after you die, hey, talk to us. We'd be more than happy to talk to you. That's a powerful thing. All right, the next one is what? Sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This is a powerful tool. Why is that? What did Jesus use when he was being tempted from, by the devil in the wilderness? This is the God-man, correct? And here he was in his weak moment, and the devil sees that, and he wants to take a stab at him. And did you notice right here, Jesus did not use his power on Satan? What do I mean by that? Satan tried to get Jesus to enact his power. Turn these stones into bread, he said. He said, jump off the building. The angels will catch you. Did you notice that there? But Jesus didn't use his power to fight against the devil. He was willing to be hungry and starve and be at his weakest moment. The Bible says the angels had to sustain him. See, Jesus didn't use his own power. What power could he rely on at that moment? He quoted scripture Amen. to Satan. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. It is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. See that? He kept quoting scripture at the devil. It is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Get thee hence, Satan. And the Bible says that the devil was able to leave him alone because of the power of the word of God. That is a powerful book. So if you want power in your life, do you have the Word of God in your heart? Okay. Or in your heart, is it sin? Is it depression? Is it lust? Is it complaint, bitterness, and world, 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 world? See that? Then you have, that's why you have no power in your life. You know, I... I really love audio Bibles because it just forces my mind and my heart to just get saturated in that. Now, don't get me wrong. Uh, I'm not saying be lazy and don't read your Bible and just listen to audio and say, hey, I read 20 chapters of the Bible, you know. I guarantee that you didn't pay attention to most, okay. But uh, now, if people do Bible reading that way and they get everything out of it, I'm not downing that, okay. God bless you, okay. But uh, what I'm trying to say right here is that I'm not condoning a lazy way of reading the Bible either. I'm just saying it's good to just saturate yourself with Bible. Saturate it by reading. When you read, underline verses, see. Let it saturate. Memorize verses. Memorize. Why? It's saturated within you. So then you're filled with Scripture, and don't you think that you get more power in your life after that? You know how I can tell certain preachers are filled with the Spirit and power of God? They read so much of Bible that their very language itself sounds like Scripture. It's really amazing. Now, there are those losers, okay, don't get me wrong, there are those losers and weirdos who just talk like King James Version, you know, and think that they're so spiritual by doing that. Thou sayest it, you know, something like that. No, come on, you know, come on. No, no, don't, stop talking like that, all right? Don't be weird, all right? Don't be weird. But you can tell when you fellowship with people that they've been into the book. You can tell. You can tell when you fellowship with people how much they've been into the book or if they've been into television or if they've been into social media, internet or certain worldly music or sin. Because when you talk out of the abundance of the heart, the what? The mouth speak it. There's something you love. There's something you love. 
If you're all into sports, you're going to saturate yourself in sports, and then those conversations come out. We can tell. So if you want power in your life, the Word of God should be the one that's saturated within you. All right, see that? It's very powerful in your life. You know what I think when the Bible says, uh, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you? You know what I think? The only case where you see Satan fleeing is with Jesus when he quoted Scripture, correct? All right, so that's the only time you would see it. Um, the second one is probably with Michael the Archangel, but it's not, as, uh, it's not as clear or effective when you see compared to Jesus, right? So the quotation, scriptural quotations, are that powerful. If that's the case, I wonder why the devil flees from you. It says not Jesus, from you. The devil will flee from you, and if the only case was scriptural quotation, I wonder if you are a walking Bible and the devil will just have to run away from you. That's one. Number two, it says submit yourselves therefore to God, right? Isn't that part of the filling power of the Spirit? So see that? That person is basically filled so much with spiritual power. That's the bottom line. That much spiritual power would just make the devil run away. That's something to think about. That's something to think about. All right. Now, we go backwards. All right. Let's go to verse 15. I want to just keep jumping backwards. Skip verse 16. We'll come there to there. But verse 15. And your feet shod with the preparation of the what? Gospel of peace. Okay. So the gospel of peace, I also believe, is a powerful part of the armor. Why? Well, for one, it saved your soul, right? But notice these two are different. What's the difference here? This is you receiving it. This is you using it, going out and giving it to other people. The gospel has the power to transform people's souls. Do you understand that? You know that power is extremely big that it's assimilated, get this, all right? Now we're going to cover two things, okay? The power of binding and loosing. That's another power that you all have. But a lot of times these are synonymous. And then there are other times that you can enact them differently. All right, let me show you how these two uh, powers work, okay? It's by putting on a backwards collar and then a crucifix and then uh, saying 20 Hail Marys. That's a dead, lifeless thing. That has no power whatsoever. Yep. But it's so ridiculous how these uh, clowns in uh, black costumes that they think that by wearing beads around their necks and then saying 20 Hail Marys, that that's the power of binding and loosing. That's some special power from heaven. And no, it's dead. Right, that's right. You, it's dead. You, people even can tell it's dead. People, when they say Hail Mary full of grapes, full of grace, all right? They're even saying it like they're dead. You notice that? Like it has no meaning. They don't see power in that. But in our case, it is powerful. This binding and loosing is for all saved believers. It's not to certain religious leaders or priests. That's not what it is. It's for all saved believers. All right. Uh, your hand is at Ephesians 6. Uh, 6 okay. Keep bookmarking it there and go to Matthew, Matthew 16. All right, you're going to practice this tonight? You want to see your, your life change tomorrow? See some power? All right, let's go to the book of Matthew. All right, chapter 16, chapter 16. Notice the power that was given to all saved believers. Matthew chapter 16. And then verse 18, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever what thou shalt bind, bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now this power of binding and loosing, you'll hear from the Catholic Church, 
that it has to do with uh, forgiveness of sins. So they got that part right, but then their problem is, is that they think it's all this Catholic mumbo-jumbo stuff. That's not what it is. The forgiveness of sins is just basically normal forgiveness. That's it. It's not some special power where you go behind one of those boxed window doors that's pretty similar to pastor's office for some weird reason. It's not like that. He looks at you, and then he whispers, and then he does this weird mumbo-jumbo with his fingers, and it's like some magic, and, you get, and then have the power of binding and loosing is being enacted. That's ridiculous. No, if it's forgiveness of sins, it's more simple than you think. It's simply anything that has to do with forgiveness of sins. No, that's right. It's that simple, duh, okay? So think about this. Isn't the gospel the one that gives forgiveness of sins to people? That's right. So when you give that to people, what are you doing? You are giving the power, enacting the power of them being loosed from their sins. It's up to them if they want it or not. When they receive that from you, and you give them the gospel, you know what you're doing? Their sins, in that sense, are loosed when they are given the gospel. But when they reject the gospel of Christ, get this, you know what you've done? Whether you meant to or not, you've bound their sins. You've condemned them. you condemned them to a devil's hell. You might say, no, I don't believe that. No, no, you, do, you are doing that because what happened is this, is that when they rejected the gospel, here they are at the great white throne judgment. They want to get out of condemnation, but they can't get out because God's going to use you as a witness against them to prove that they are truly condemned. See, you condemn them. You condemn them. The Bible says that he that believeth not is what? Condemned already. See, their sins are retained, so to speak. It's still kept. It's bound. That's what happens. Uh, Jesus Christ mentioned, I forgot where, but I think it was in the book of John, that their sins are retained, so to speak. There's a wording on that one. Sins are retained. But then their sins are loosed when they receive the gospel that you give to them. But... This becomes even more simplified when we look at Matthew 18. Notice in Matthew 18, Jesus applies this power to the entire uh, church. Say, brethren, it's not uh, Peter or some religious leader or the Pope. Look at the book of Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, verse 18. Matthew 18, 18. Context, verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven, right? What's the context? Forgiveness. Look at verse 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee. See that? Go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Do you know why forgiveness is important in church? Not bitterness, not fighting, not getting along. That is that will sap, like I told you, that will sap all your spiritual power. If you got bitterness, if you got issues with the brethren, you want power of God? How well are you practicing forgiveness? Amen, you, you don't want to forgive? That's why you have no power. That's the problem with you. That's a huge detriment to Bible-believing churches. You know why I think Bible believers are splitting more and more and more and more? They're not practicing forgiveness. They know so much Bible, but they don't practice forgiveness. They're just hearers of the word, but not doers of it, deceiving themselves. All right, so notice how powerful this is. If, uh, if the person refuses to reconciliation, then verse 16, you take two or three more witnesses, and that power is in place, but they reject it, then look at verse 17, you treat them like a heathen and a publican. Notice that you kick them out, correct? If they are kicked out, notice this power. This power is so big, you don't realize what you're doing, but go to 1 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians 5. You know what happened? Get this. 
you've turned them over to Satan. That power of binding is for real, man. You have power to turn over them to the devil, even though you didn't mean to. Didn't you know that? You might say, why? Because remember this, if, you're, if they don't receive forgiveness, then who has them? It's that simple. See, who has them? The devil. So what you've done is this, is that if you give them forgiveness and they receive forgiveness, you freed them from the devil's grasp, and then they, uh, they receive that power of forgiveness, and their life is changed. But when they reject that, then they're what? They're turned over to the devil. You can do that, believe it or not. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Notice that kick, getting kicked out of the church at Matthew 18 in 1 Corinthians 5, we see a person kicked out of the church. And what did Paul define this as? 1 Corinthians 5, uh, verse 2. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that, and that he that hath done this deed might be what? Taken away from you. Kick him out of the church, because this guy committed fornication. Look at verse 3. For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present concerning him that has so done this deed in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together and my spirit with the what? Power. power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Ain't that serious? Lost people, it's a no-brainer. They go to hell when they're turned over to the devil. Their soul is turned over to him. But notice... A lot of people didn't catch this. This is a saved believer. If a saved believer messes up in the church and he gets kicked out, his body, not his soul, because his soul is belonged to the Lord, but his body is turned over to the devil. You don't think the devil can get your body? Have you seen what Satan did to Job's body? That ain't a, that ain't a picnic, man. That's serious. I, I can tell you stories of a few people who uh, left the church or got kicked out, so to speak, even though I didn't really kick them out. But it turned out by that act, they became. The devil really controlled them. It's really sad. Do I want that? No. But see, that's the power that I've got. And you know what that does? That, caught, that puts, which is a good thing, that puts fear upon people. Why? Because they know you got the power. <laughs> people want to be big and bad, no martial arts, you know, come from prison, get into gang, get a gun or something like that so that people can fear them. Buddy, buddy, that ain't power compared to what you guys got. They should fear you. You know what they've done when they put their hands on a child of God? I like this um, um, uh, the comic from Jack Chick, uh, the Crusader comics, he had uh, the first one where there was a guy who, uh, want, who was about to kill some black preacher and the black preacher said, uh, you can't kill me. And then the big bad dude said, what do you mean I can't kill you? He said, you got to get permission from your father first. And then the, the guy said, my father, hey man, you don't know my father. And the black preacher said, oh, yes, I do. Your father is the devil. And for you to put your hands on me, your father got to ask permission from my father first. Hey. <laughs> that's power. And then the guy got saved in the end after that, actually. See, that's fear there. That's power. That's for real. That's for real. The power of binding and loosing. You should have saw the Great Awakening Revival preachers. Do you know how many of those liquor merchants, big bad dudes, guys with knives and guns, that they were scared of these preachers? Because they got the power of God in it. Yeah. They don't want to mess with God's man because something bad might happen, right? Mm -hmm. What's that? The power of binding and loosing. You kids saved? You got that power. That's serious power. That's serious power. Okay, so that's why um, it's important that we practice forgiveness. If you don't, then you lose the power. All right, that's very important. You got to practice forgiveness. If you're not witnessing the gospel, you don't have a powerful life. 
All right? Start witnessing to souls out there. Amen. All right, now let's go back. Y'all getting a blessing? Amen. All right, go back. Ephesians 6. That's become a powerful church. That's what I want. Amen, brother. If we all enact these, if we all practice these. All right, verse 14, Ephesians 6, 14. The Bible says, Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. All right, the belt of truth is important for you to receive power from God. You might say, how so? Because I'll tell you so many times that if I never practiced this, I would have lost power from God. Do you know how I became a powerful preacher? you know why I'm able to help people with problems who have very complicated or heavy issues in counseling? You know, I've dealt with people, I mean, uh, you should get, you should see sometimes the emails. I have to deal with, uh, we have to deal with what, a hundred or something like that? And then I have to give an answer like that. You know, how can we deal with all this stuff? How can I deal with all that stuff? You know why? Because I got the belt of truth. What do you mean by that? When I went through my issues in my life, or my pain that I went through, I had to take a careful look at myself first. An honest look. I had to be honest with myself. That's a, even lost people admit that. Lost people admit the problem within people when they go through counseling sessions is that people ref, uh, are running away from the truth about themselves. All right? The truth is, is that you are angry. The truth is, is that you do have impatience issues. The truth is, is that you do get scared easily. You have anxiety problems. The truth is, is that it is your fault, even though you can have legitimate rights to point out the other person's fault. Exactly. Did that make any sense? Mm -hmm. See, you all try to avoid that. That's our human nature. We all just want to run away from that. But instead of always looking at other people's faults or blaming it on the environment, blaming it on some tragedy that happened or some incident, let's look at ourselves and see, hey, this is my issue here, which is weakening my life, which is robbing me of God's blessings. If that thing, that defect of yours stays inside you and you refuse to confront it truthfully and get it right with God, then, you will rem then your Christian life and warfare and manifestation of his power will always be handicapped. Do you understand? You can wave that sword of the Spirit all you want and that thing's got the power, but if you refuse to get some issues of yourself, if you refuse to get those things fixed, this will always be a handicap. It'll be a handicap swing of the sword of the Spirit. No matter how much of a real Bible believer you are, you're just an impaired real Bible believer. Does that make any sense? The verse says loins, right? That's what? That's strength. That's power. That's where all that, all that strength and power lies, is within the loins. That's why altar call is the greatest thing. Confront the truth, get on the altar, repent, so that you can get power from God. That's a powerful moment. Powerful, serious, sober moment. Okay. Another powerful thing it says in having on the breastplate of righteousness. So in other words, righteous living, holy living. You might say, why is that powerful? Because it goes with two things here, believe it or not. We're going to cover two things. So um, uh, go to, oh, we'll just go to one passage for time's sake. But I want your other hand to go to, uh, I think it was 2 Corinthians. All right, go to 2 Corinthians. Go to the book of uh, 2 Corinthians, and actually, it is not in 2 Corinthians, so it is 1 Corinthians chapter 11, chapter 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Okay, why is righteousness important to receive power? Because it goes in line with other two things where, you, where there is much power. Holy living has power, and if you don't think so, God's most important attribute is what? Holiness, not, omni not uh, omnipotence. Do you understand? 
It's his holiness, not his omnipotence. That's his most prized attribute. And he is an all-powerful God. And if he thinks that attribute is most important to him, I think this is a big deal then. Clean living is power. It has to do with God's attribute. Uh, so that's a third thing, God's attribute. But the two are as follows. One is the filling of the Spirit. You might say, why is the acts of righteousness part of the filling of the Spirit? Because, uh, this gave up the ghost, okay. Because the filling of the Spirit, remember from your basic um, doctrine study, from beginner's discipleship, how do you get filled with the Spirit? You desire, you pray, and do you remember the third one? Yield to get the filling of the Spirit. When you yield to the Spirit, what is that? Well, when you read Galatians 5, if you want to turn there, you can turn there too, all right? But Galatians chapter 5, and then verse uh, 18 through 22 probably, 18 through 22, the verse says, Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. These are contrary the one to the other. In other words... When you yield to the Holy Spirit, sin is out of the picture. Righteous living increases. So if you want power from God, you need to stay clean. How is your clean living? If you're not living clean, then you got half the power. You can read that book, you can pray, but you'll still get half the power if you're still messing around with sin. That's a problem. Okay, so now some of you are feeling guilty, and some of you are like, man, what do I do with that? Well, let's cover the second power, 1 Corinthians 11, the Lord's Supper. You might say, really, the Lord's Supper has the power? Yeah, it is powerful. You know why? Because it's not the power, get this, all right, this is where Catholics mess up. It's not the power of turning the bread and the wine into the body and blood of Jesus. That ain't the power. That's just a uh, made-up fairy tale, all right? I sooner believe that Santa Claus exists and that Jesus would do that, okay? And I'm being serious too, actually, okay? So I'd sooner believe in Santa Claus than that. That's just ridiculous. Who would believe in that? That ain't powerful. The priest just wasted his time speaking in Latin, all right? Nothing happened. But they overlook the power of the Lord's Supper because of all that Catholic mumbo-jumbo. You know what the power is? The power is this. The power is when you partake in the Lord's Supper, if you don't take it with righteous living, with your sins taken care of, you can get sick and you can die. I think that's powerful. All right? That's why we're all pretty serious at the Lord's Supper, right? All right, the most serious that I ever saw from our church, more than weeping on altar calls, more than counseling, is Lord's Supper. I've never seen such a sober, serious thing all my life. Because I know what you're all thinking, okay? <laughs> and you're thinking about Jesus when he bled and died for, you, for your sins, and then you feel unworthy, and you're like, some people didn't take the Lord's Supper because they felt unworthy, actually. And then I had to encourage them, no, 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 no. I mean, uh, you got to take it, you know, right. because there is another power that helps you take it, which I'll cover soon, okay? But the thing is, is that the Lord's Supper has such power. That's why it's important to have righteous living. Because if you don't, then what's going to happen is when you partake in the Lord's Supper, the power from the Lord's Supper could be where it will get you sick and you can even die. There's power in that. Whatever's going on, listen guys, do you understand this? In that the Spirit doesn't just show up when we sing and shout. Do you understand? The Spirit doesn't show up when we just run the aisles or get on the altar. The Spirit shows up when you hold that unleavened bread and that grape juice in your hand. You and I can tell, right? Something's, something, something's going on, right, when that happens. And we, and, we get, and we enjoyed it a lot, didn't we, the Lord's Supper? It's a very serious moment, but it's a very treasured moment that we all enjoy because the power of the Spirit is present there. 
something's going on. Okay, now let's. You messed up, so you lose the power of the Spirit, right? You messed up, so then you feel like you can't partake in the Lord's Supper. You need another power to get your power of righteousness back. Guess what that power is? So it comes back to forgiveness of sins. So let's specify this. Because binding and loosing is not applicable in this case for forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins comes from binding and loosing, but not just that. It comes from what else? The blood of Jesus, the power of confession. Amen. See, that's not the same Roman Catholic confession of binding and loosing. These are all separated. The Catholics just conflated everything and ruined the power. This forgiveness of sins is you doing the confession yourself. And mid-acts hyper-dispensationalists have lost that power. That's why they have no power in their teachings or in their living. Because they don't have the, the blood of Jesus Christ through the confession of sins. All right, so the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is salient to receive the power. Okay, now uh, I'm, I know that time's almost up. Yikes, okay, so how about this? How about this? Um, I will continue the rest when I come back, okay? Because, yeah, I know, I, I know y'all hate me for doing that, but, <laughs> but this one, uh, the shield of faith is actually going to take a while. This is very important, shield of faith. So we'll cover this one the next time. So, so faith has power. And then there are several other elements of power here that we need to cover. But the power of confession of sins from the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, that is a very powerful thing. So how often do you practice confession, right? I confess two to three times a day, man. Because why? I need it if I want power from God. Because I know that, I, you know, a lot of times I'm weak whenever I don't clean myself. Do you understand? Righteousness is important. To get this power back, I need to enact this power. And this power that I enact, I can get back to this power. Amen. And when I get back to this power... It contributes to these two other powers. You notice how all these powers are all separate and different. They're not conflated with each other, but they all interact right. to, to, to do something in your life. Powerful Christian walk and living. That's something, right? Amen. Why do you need to go blah, 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 like that and then, oh, I need to heal and see people sick who get healed? And no, that... You know, that's just signs. You're limiting the power of God. They underestimate, they overlook all these other precious things that are so important for a Christian's life where you can receive true power from on high. All right, I hope this was a blessing to you. And then we'll learn more when I come back, all right? And then we can learn about the other powerful things from God. So I guess after tonight, you're only going to get half the power of God. I'm sorry. All right. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I pray that tonight's teaching was a blessing to the hearers. May we apply them, practice them, live them. Lord, what a wonderful thing that you've given to us. But Lord, we've dismissed it. We've neglected it. We belittled. We sure belittled them. Father, I pray that we will not belittle these things. These are powerful tools, things in our life, impacting ourselves and other people around us. So I pray that we will practice them like we should. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.